Let's look at Galatians today. And you know what? I'm kind of sad because we're coming to a close on it. So we're actually going to have a closing statement here at the end of Galatians. There'll be one more wrap-up. We'll have one more wrap-up session after this. Uh, but this is, this is sort of a, it's a typical closing section for Paul. We're starting in chapter 6. There's only six chapters in Galatians. And, uh, and, he, and what he's going to do is what he does many times. Is he, he's going to give us some practical advice uh, about, you know, we've just done five chapters about talking about legalism and the problems with legalism and all that kind of stuff. And so now he's going to say, as I get ready to leave this letter in your hands, here's some practical advice. This is the so what. So, so what? So what do I do at this point? What, how do I apply this in my life? And I thought it'd be good right here to pause and ask ourselves, since we are all experts on the doctrines and his advice in the first five chapters, what would your be, what would be your parting practical advice to someone after we've talked so much about legalism and the problems of legalism and the power of grace. What do you say where the rubber meets the road tomorrow morning, Monday morning? So my practical advice to you is... Let Jesus drive your life. Let Jesus drive your life? Yeah, that's pretty good. Any other practical advice? You EJ. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, go to Hebrews to continue the story. Hebrews gets deep. Or go to Romans to continue the story. He takes the uh, topics of Galatians and expands them out into many chapters. So, VJ, you're going to have... What? Seek his kingdom first. Seek his kingdom first. Great word from Matthew 5. Yeah, exactly. Those are all great things. There's more things I would suggest. I made a little list in pencil at my table. I thought, well, I would say, you know, we talked about the fact that when you're in legalism, you're into making lists of things to do. My parting comment would be, stop making lists, right? That's what I would kind of figure out. Or I had a couple other things. And so as, I, as we go into chapter 6, I was astonished where he goes. As practical advice, as the outcome of this is what we've learned about legalism in terms of you know, living a list of things. And so that's our choices, but let's see where he goes. And we start basically... Um, I'll give you actually an overview of what the two things are, and then we'll explain them. There's two of them. One, one of them is this effect I call the bell curve church, and then the other one is what I call the free to chill church. <laughs> so we're going to look at those two things, and that's where he goes. This is where he's going to go. And you're saying, I don't know what that means. I, did, I named those intentionally, so you wouldn't. So there you go. We start with a picture. Um, the church, you know, is the gathering of the followers of Jesus. That, that's what it is. These are people who've already decided to follow Jesus, and they just gather together to share that experience together. But is your experience in church look like this or look like this? And this will tell where he's trying to go. For instance, on the left picture over there, okay, this left picture over here, this is uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's actually the seven place winners in this particular competition. Uh, is it Eight. Oh, yeah, there's eight on the left. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, uh, uh, many times when you go into a church, if you're new in the church, you realize that there's sort of a pecking order in the church. Huh? You ever notice this? So you have people who are on the top. It's usually the pastor. And then you have all these other people, you know, that, that, are, that have varying levels. Of, well, yes, I'm on, the, I'm on the council, and we decide things that are important that impact on your life. And you, and you kind of go down the list, and there's this hierarchy of authority, it seems like, but it's more than authority. It's, it seems like it's more about achievement. You know, there's people who've been here for a while who are great achievers in the church, and they're highly recognized, and they have a certain reputation because of that. And there's this hierarchy that goes on. And, and that people end up climbing their way to the top based on how they perform in church, or at least how they look in church. Ah, right? You know, they can be dirtbags all through the week, but you come into church, you know, and you dress right, and you say the right things, and you do the right thing, then you sort of, you're kind of inching up. And you notice that in that particular kind of a church, it's a competitive thing. It's competitive. So you have people who try and inch their way up, and they say, well, those people over there did this. I should probably do that too. So you incorporate that into your life, and then those people say, hey, they're doing that now too. I have to do something new. And there's kind of this pecking order of good people. Have you never been in a church like that? I've been in a church like that. That's bad. But then on the other side is this right here. Is, is the church look more like a place where wounded people are tended to by other wounded people? And that's really what it ought to be. So this is, this is not a trick question. The picture on the left is bad. It, churches should never be a place of competing goodness. They should be a place where people find is what it is. It's more like a hospital in that particular sense. But to be that way, it takes 
uh, departure from legalism. And you'll see how this works in a second. He's going to just march right in, verse 1 of chapter 6, and say, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such one in a spirit of gentleness. So this guy who's laying on the stretcher didn't just break his arm. He is caught in sin is the problem. And by the way, when it says, you know, if you're caught in any trespass, that, that doesn't mean someone catches you and says, aha, I knew it, ha, I caught you, caught you, caught you. No, it is more like, think more like a bear trap where you step in it and it goes, ka-chunk, and it catches you. So what he's saying is that there are people among you in church who have stepped in the bear trap of sin and they're caught in it and they can't get their leg out of this trap. What you who are spiritual, that is, if you're thinking about the fact that, you, that there's bigger issues than just living and eating and all that kind of stuff, there's spiritual issues involved in this trespass, you need to come to the aid of that person who's caught in this sin that they can't get out of. Now, to, to kind of uh, raise the contrast on this, we're talking about sins that are not inconsequential. We're talking about nasty things, things that don't get talked about by proper climbers in the church for instance what if you find out that someone you're sitting next to is involved in an affair and they're married and they're caught in this affair well now you have you have a couple of choices you can say well i don't think i want to become identified with this person's problems because after all it is kind of dirty it's kind of dirty i'll just let them work it out and oh i know what i can do i'll just pray for them God fix this because it's too embarrassing for me to fix it. You know what I'm talking about? So there's, there's these kinds of things that are so distasteful. Let's make it even more distasteful. Say you find out that someone's involved deeply in pornography and can't get out of it. Ew. And you find out about that in church. Well, good luck with that. I'll pray for you about that. And he says no. What he's saying is that what you need to do is you need to come alongside, just like the person in this picture, and, and kneel down and say, I'm going to walk with you through this and we're going to get you out of this. That means you might get dirty. That means you might, it might affect whether you're standing on the third platform or the fourth platform in church because now suddenly you're associated with someone who's involved in something that puts them on the 35th platform in church. You know what I'm saying? It means getting dirty. And that's the total opposite to this this rank and file thing that happens in a church when you have this competitive goodness thing going on. There are people in our midst who are struggling with sin, and instead of us saying, I'd rather just not, I'd rather think it's just not there because after all, we're all good. Can't you put on a good face and not talk about that on Sunday morning? No, we have to, it should be a place where you can say, look, this is, this is killing me. Can you help me out of this? And we get dirty with one another. That does not work in the competitive risers of first, second, third place in the church. It doesn't. So he says, you need to restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Now, he says spirit of gentleness because what's your first reaction when you find someone's involved in something that just as grosses you out? Ew! you got to get over that. That's really stinky. Oh, oh, take that home and uh, figure it out. I just don't want to. Or you say, what is your problem? The rest of us don't have that problem. Why do you have that problem? What is your problem? Come on, work on it. I'm on number two here. If you want to get up to number 14, you got to work on that and fix it yourself. We're usually condemning. The other thing that happens, at least in these competitive good churches, is you usually say, I'm on, say, number 10 on the steps, and he was on number nine, so now he's going down to number 12, and I'm coming up to number nine to take his place. Woo-hoo. You actually, You actually revel in someone's spiritual problems. Because they go down and you go up. At least, I'm not involved in something like that. See see the competitive stuff? This stinks. And what it does is it keeps you from actually doing what he says, which is to come alongside, to get down low, where they're on their stretch, you're dying, and you say, I'm going to walk you through this. We're going to figure this out, because this is just not healthy for you. This is not life. This is hard. But in the competitive churches, you'll never have that. You'll never have that. Yeah, yeah, Dave. It does. It does. It happens right here as well. Yeah. 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 We need, we need to do this. And, and that's, that's why he brings it up. Even if, you've, 
Even if you've been paying attention in the first five chapters about legalism, and you can get to the end of his letter and say, well, I got the legalism thing fixed, you probably don't do this because of legalism issues. Because you're still trying to maintain your perfect walk and not get dirtied by somebody else. And worse than that, and let's get real personal about this, worse than that, you're less willing to tell people that you're the person on, this, on that stretcher. Because it affects your standing in the church. Ah! So we'll keep talking about this. But you're, you're right, Dave. This is, this is not just some other church. This is us. This is, this, is the, this is the common problem we have when we see churches as a place to achieve our sense of goodliness competitively with one another. The last thing we're going to do is raise your hand and say, uh, I've got a problem. Will anyone help me? But that ought to be what goes on routinely in church. Routinely. Okay? He keeps going on. <clears throat> he says, each, of one, each one of you looking to yourself so that you won't be tempted to. So there is a danger with getting low to that stretcher and helping that person. Whatever it is that's tempting them that they're caught in this bear trap of, it can happen to you when you get close to the problem. It, this is, all he's saying is that this is dangerous ground right here. This is dangerous ground. And so go in with your eyes open and careful and watch out because there is a severe battle for your soul going on and the evil one prowls about like a lion to find out who he can devour. And even while you're in the process of helping someone else who's caught in this trap, he may devour you too. So, so watch out. Now, the reason he mentions this is because what happens many times when we come down to help somebody else, at least, now this is my thinking, so if you can't relate to this, I'm all alone here, but my thinking is, is I look at that person who's lowly and, sh- and put out by this problem, and I say, well, I'm sure glad I don't struggle with that. You know, I'll, Since I'm like that, I'll go help them right now. And you kind of come down to the level and say, I don't have your problem, but you know. And, you, and you're thinking more of yourself than you really ought to, because you know what? You're a potential target of the same thing. And in fact, it's hard. It's hard to help somebody else who's in that position if you're taking this top-down approach. I'm so glad that God has spared me from this so I can, in my righteousness, help you. Yeah, no. No. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. Somehow we have to be able to say to ourselves, this is dangerous ground. And this could and maybe has happened to me. I'm liable to just fall in the same thing. That's why I can come alongside of them, put my arm around them, and say, let's go through this together. Maybe in perhaps in your case, God has freed me from this previously, and you can say there's hope. There's hope. There's a way out of this bear trap. And let me walk with you through. I'll walk with you as long as it takes. We'll get out of this. Rather than, ew, you're icky. Get your life together. Go away. Because after all, church is about maintaining goodness. Right? He goes on, and he says, <clears throat> bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. Now, in a competitive, goodly church, you don't bear one another's burdens. It's all about you. It's all about maintaining you and your status. And if you bear someone else's burdens, they could drag you down. And that's what the legalism of the competitive goodness does. You always are maintaining at least the vision of being clean on the outside, whether you are or not, is another issue. But, he says, bear one another's burdens. You need to actually lift up someone else and walk with them and say, we're going to get from there to here by God's grace. I'll walk with you in the process. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. And thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Well, what's the law of Christ? Remember, he's been talking the first five chapters about the law. And we said, oh, the law, you can't be justified with God by obeying the law. Obeying the law to be justified, to make yourself right with the king, obeying the law on the list. So now in kind of a, a turn of phrase, he says, but this conforms to the law of Christ. You mean there's a law that Jesus gave? Yes. And there it is. John 13, 34, Jesus speaking. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all men will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. Why would Jesus ever have to command that? Because when I become a believer and I go to church, I'm loving, right? Uh, Actually, no. We're still kind of contaminated with this sin that's called selfishness. Selfishness and sin are almost synonymous, by the way. They're almost synonymous. Yeah, so that's the problem. But Jesus actually hikes it up a little bit. He says, don't just love each other. He says, how much do you love? See what he says? 
even as I have loved you. How did Jesus ultimately love them? He died for them. He said, I'm going to die so that you can live. Now, now we're talking about a different bar to jump over. He says, I give you a commandment, and that commandment is love one another. And this love doesn't just mean, you know, the, the birds tweeting around your head and hearts and all that kind of stuff. It really means a conscious commitment to be committed to the good of another, regardless, regardless, without any kind of qualifications. And if that involves great sacrifice to you, then okay, because Jesus sacrificed much for me. That's the picture of the loving church, is those who, because Christ loved them sacrificially, they love sacrificially for each other. They say, I'll go with you the distance. I'll go whatever it takes. Oh, I hate to burden you. No, you're not burdening me. Let's just do this. We're going to do this. We're going to get you out of this bear claw thing because you need to understand that this thing is killing you, and I'll do whatever it takes to help you. That's that's what real church looks like. It's not a competitive structure of people trying to outdo each other in goodness. It's about people going as low as possible to pull each other up out of the sin that happens because Jesus says, love each other like I loved you, which means to die for each other. Now that's that's a transformed congregation. And the plus on this is not only that people will be cared for and that sin, which is very self-destructive, will finally be dealt with, but... What's the effect on the outlying community that walks in and looks at you? They say, they look like they're with Jesus, his disciples. The distinguishing characteristic of those who follow Jesus are those who sacrificially love one another and die for one another. Not the people who march around saying, I'm number four in my church, and I hope to be number three next year if I can take on some new callings. Oh, it's just stinky. It's about being low and pulling people out of the real self-destructive effects of sin. Okay? Here's another one, 1 John 4. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Hello? And actually, the connection between that <clears throat> is pretty obvious. The deal is, is that God loves us. He loves those who are even deep in sin. And if those are the people that God loves, then what are we doing hating them if he loves them? That's, that's not so. I, I love my family. I love my kids, most of them. Yeah, I love my kids. There's one right here. But I love my kids. So if you come into my house, hospitality-wise, you come into my house and you say, I'm sorry, I, I just don't, I don't like that one. No, no. You know how offensive that would be to me? Because I love them. I would expect you, if you're with me, to love them too. So that's really all he's talking about, is that God loves these people that you run into, even when they're doing dirtbaggy injustice things. He loves them tremendously. If you're with God, you will, you will have that same love for them as well. That's just the way it works. That's just the way it works. Oh, he loves us and we're, dirtbags. we're dirtbags and he loves us. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's push on. We're not making much progress here. Verse 3. If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. <laughs> it, it looks kind of like this. So here we go. Here's pedestal number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in the competitiveness of goodness in the church. And the guy at the top says, I'm something. <laughs> Nervous laughter. <laughs> and if you're thinking right now, gee, I wonder what pedestal number I'm on. And then, you're, then you've gone the wrong way. That's not what we're talking about right here. What he's saying is that if you think you're something, when in truth the fact is you're nothing, you're deceiving yourself. You're you're talking yourself up into a big lie when you're doing that. And and why? Because you look around competitively with the other competitive good people in the competitive good competitive church, and you say, well, I'm doing better than them, so I must be above them, whatever their number is, right? But the problem is, is that this is all eclipsed by the cross, When the cross comes on the scene and you understand what Christ has done on our behalf for us, it kind of flattens things. (laughs) In reality, it flattens things. So if indeed you lose sight of the sacrifice of love on the cross for you, being a dirtbag like Steve says he is, I mean, we all are, we all are dirtbags, and you realize how unworthy you are for what he did sacrificially love on your behalf, it's very hard to climb up on pedestal one anymore or pedestal two, or pedestal three, or even to competitively try and outdo your neighbor in church by being gooder than them. Because after all, 
there is really only one who's done great good, and that's Jesus. And the rest of us are on one plane. That's why the phrase is, is, is the ground at the foot of the cross is flat. There's no one who stands elevated over somebody else because in comparison to what Christ has done for you, your puny accomplishments in church mean nothing. So quit ranking yourself against other people in church who are doing other puny good things and wondering if you're getting to the top of the pyramid. Ah! Stinks. There's only one, Christ. And Paul says this many times when he talks about the body, about the church collected. He says, he says, there is one head and then there's like the rest of us. Now we have different roles and there's nothing wrong with those different roles, but in terms of contribution, psh, it's the cross. Jesus is what he's done on our behalf. And did I qualify for that by climbing up to pedestal two, three, or one? And then I can finally do enough good that I can warrant the qualification to benefit from his love for me? No! I stay down at the bottom. It has nothing to do with rank anywhere. God is no respecter of persons. That's what that phrase means. He doesn't care where you come from. He doesn't, think it, he doesn't care if you think you're number one in church or number two or three. He just doesn't care. But God, I'm better than them. I don't care. He loved you where you were at. While you were yet sinning, Christ died for you. While you were yet sinning, he dies for you. That's astonishing. Romans 12, Paul goes on over here and says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So he says, literally, get off your high horse. <laughs> Think rationally about who you are. And by the way, I've said this many times before, but biblically the word humility isn't about being as low as possible. It just means being level with what you are, just honest with who you are. Now, when you're honest with who you are, it's very hard to climb up to pedestal one if you're honest with who you are. Or either eight or nine or maybe even 112. Yeah, I know. It's just very hard when you're honest with yourself. And, you know, we will be honest under certain circumstances. We'll be honest and say, well, I'm not perfect, but that's actually a terrible phrase. You don't want to go there. You need to say, I'm a sinner, unqualified for grace, but their grace found me and his love rescued me out of that. What did I do to qualify for it? Nothing. Nothing. He even gave me the faith to accept that offer of his grace. See the faith? That measure of faith. So he says, you know, just, just don't do that. Think rationally about this kind of stuff. Okay, verse 4. But each one, each one, talking about you now, each one of you must examine his own work, and then he'll have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone. Now, if you see that boasting word and that troubles you, I'll, I'll explain that in just a second. But, but this is actually the introduction of the Bell Curve Church right here. The Bell Curve Church where you have great godly achievers on the right and great godly failures on the left. And, uh, and you know who you are. No, don't try and place yourself on this chart. You tried to do that, didn't you? Well, I can't go all the way to the A range, but I'll go B, B minus, B plus, because after all, I'm not perfect. Ha, ah, don't say that anymore. That's just the wrong thing to say. Don't, what he's saying, each one must examine his own. Did you ever go to a class and you say to yourself, boy, I did really badly, I hope he grades on the curve, which means, okay, I might have done really badly, but hopefully other people did worse. And then relatively speaking, I'll go back up to pedestal three or four while they all go down to minus 15, see? So on the curve, what he's saying right here is, nah, no, there's no curve. No one's getting graded relative to everyone else. Everyone's getting graded according to themselves. Do you see it in the phrase he says? Each one must examine his own work, and then he'll have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone. Himself alone. You're in this entire thing about righteousness on your own and not based on the person next to you's failure to do so. Okay? Righteousness is not graded on a curve in church. It's based on you. Now, let me, let me highlight this a little bit. He goes on and says, and not in regard to another. So that's exactly what he's getting at. It's all about you. Forget about everybody else. No one's getting graded on the curve in church. Quit trying to compete in terms of godliness. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. So for who regards you as superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? So he even goes on over there and says, boasting, uh, this is why I'm explaining the boasting. Boasting isn't boasting about who you are, because in 1 Corinthians he says, there's nothing that's good about you that you didn't receive. Really. 
So quit boasting about it. So that's not what we're talking about, boasting about that stuff. In another place in 1 Corinthians, he says, says this in verse 1, uh, chapter 1, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, Christ became to us wisdom from God, he became righteousness, sanctification, redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So in the end, this boast word actually isn't about the bad boasting we think about. It's basically kind of the self-assessment. If you self-assessed yourself, not relative to anybody else, but if you self-assessed yourself and you gave yourself, if you ranked yourself in terms of how am I doing, how am I not doing, and it's all based on yourself, this is what you glory in or you don't glory in. And Paul's saying, when I do a self-assessment, the only thing I can boast in is what Christ has done for me. <laughs> when I do an honest self-assessment, and that is I boast about how great I am, I can't boast about how great I am, because when I look honestly in the self-assessment, I'm a jerk. But he loved me and died for me, and if there's any good coming out of my life, it's because he's transformed me in the process. If I'm going to boast, Paul says, I'll boast in the Lord. But you're not going to boast relative to other people. That's what he's saying in the Galatians passage. It's not about you versus other people and God grading on the godliness curve at all. It's you and you alone. And if you're honest, you'll say, at my lowest, I realized I deserve nothing. There's nothing I can do to earn God's favor on my behalf. But in his love, while I was sinning, he still died for me. I'll boast in that. Boast in the Lord. It's not a relative issue. <clears throat> and he finishes this out by, I just want to show you, see his own work, himself alone, not in regard to another. So the whole bell curve uh, idea of a church where you rank yourself to other people based on relative godliness is just a crock. It just is this wrong. So let's say you're over there. See, you're on kind of the C minus side. That's where I ranked myself as soon as I put the picture up. Oh, stop that. Just stop doing that. Where do I fit in church? I'm a C minus kind of person. No, but let's say you're over there. What you're normally going to do when you're on that slope of the curve is you're going to say, well, okay, I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not as bad as the D and F people. And you think for some reason that gives you some kind of elevation and you're better because of that. I'm not perfect, but God, do you know how many people are worse than me? And God will say, I don't care. It's all about you. It's, let's just talk about you. And that's all Paul's trying to get straight in Galatians. Let's just talk about you for a second and forget about everybody else. Forget about everybody else. For each one will bear his own load. And then this is back, he's coming back to it. And he's talking about in terms of judgment. Um, you're not going to have an operative argument that you're doing better or worse than other people, and that's going to have any bearing at judgment or about the bearing of your righteousness or anything. Everyone bears his own load. And this, just like this, he says in Romans 14, so then each one of us will give an account of himself to God and not give an account of himself relative to the rest of the bell curve. Just you. Just you. Now, I mention this because there is a very popular misconception about judgment and heaven and hell. And the popular misconception is this. I live my life. I do as much good in my life as possible. I commit myself to doing good. I'm not perfect. Oh, I hate that phrase. I do as much good as possible. And then by the end of my life, when I face judgment, there will be this scale. And on one side will have the weight of my good deeds, and the other side will have the weight of my bad deeds. And now this is a lie. And then uh, hopefully when I get to that judgment, I'll be tipped by the time I die psh, like this. So my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. And God will say, on total, you're more good than you are bad. And then you go to heaven. That is a total lie. A total lie. Now, if you've heard that, if you've heard that in the context of other religious systems or other even social cultural systems, that is just an utter lie. Because when you get to judgment... God's not going to use a relative balance that is a grading on the curve balance based on you or anybody else. And some people think, you know, well, if I do as much good as possible, I'm not sure to outweigh the bad, but clearly my good is better than the good balance of, say, Hitler. And if Hitler's going to the bad place, I'll go to the good place. No, that's such an unbiblical thought, I just can't tell you how unbiblical that is. And we've already studied through this in, in Galatians. He said, if you want to try and perfect yourself by making the list from the law of Moses and then checking it off and doing it perfectly, then, buddy, you better do it perfectly. You have to do every single piece. And if you fail in one, that's not a matter of a slight imbalance. That means the whole thing's wrong. 
You, you fail once, that's it. You fail once, that's it. And he says that in James as well. You, if you want to go the perfect route, you better buckle down and be perfect. And of course, he says, and so does Jesus, that's impossible. The apostles came to Jesus. Well, Jesus, how is anyone going to be saved? It's impossible. And Jesus says, what's impossible with God, with man, is possible with God. So, so really, you don't want to go there. The, the, whole, the whole balance of goodness thing is really a lie. It's really a lie. What you have to do if you want to make it into heaven is you have to completely eradicate everything on the negative side of the scale. Everything. And now some religious systems will tell you it's possible. But, biblically, God tells us it's not possible to do that on your own. And also, the pragmatic reality of our life from day to day tells us we can't do it. Have you ever made New Year's resolutions? How many months did it go? Month and a half? Months. Let's measure it in days. No, let's measure it in hours. We already know, pragmatically, that when we buckle down to be good, we never succeed. I mean, and that's not to say you can't do charitable good things for people, and I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that can you completely rid yourself of evil? And when I say that, remember I said before, sin is synonymous with selfishness. Let's put it in that sense. Can you ever completely eradicate yourself of selfishness? And if your answer is, I don't think so, then you agree with the idea of what the fall did to mankind because what the fall did to mankind was make him terminally selfish. You're stuck on yourself for the rest of your life. And that creates sin. And as James says, is there conflicts and anger among you? It's because you're pursuing what yourself wants, your passions. So that's what I'm getting at. So he's saying right here, each one must bear his own load, give his own account to God, forget about grading on the curve. It's not going to help you then or now, so quit trying to compete in that. So the, the summary of this first of the two is legalism, in the real sense, what legalism does is it creates the bell curve church. It creates a group of people who think that if I do better and better and better and gooder and gooder and gooder, and I do the list better than the person sitting next to me, I get elevated above them, and we compete for the top place in church based on our achievement of the list. Legalism builds a bell-shaped curve, and it stinks. Absolutely stinks. And someone who is desperate to be rescued out of sin and their situation of sin comes into a church like that, and they said, I went in there one Sunday, and I left, but I got to tell you something. They're a bunch of holier-than-thous. They're all competing about being good and looking good, even though I know in my business dealing, some of them are absolutely crooked. But they come to church, and they look good so they can maintain number three on the podium. It's, it's, I just can't tell you how disgusting this is. And that's what legalism does. Legalism says as its heart, I can make myself better and then when you get in a collection of people who are all doing that, it spawns a belcher of church who are always competing with one another for the top place of the best person. And it stinks. It stinks. It should be something much different. It should be more like this, where people come in and say, I'm hurting desperately. Do you have an answer? And we say, yes, in Christ, with his spirit in us, he can rescue us not only from the consequences of that sin, but from the reality of it in our life tomorrow morning. He can rescue us. But it means <clears throat> going to a place where people don't compete for godliness by making a list of legalism. It's the lie of the devil. It's the do, do gooder and gooder and gooder, then you get a better chance at judgment. And so here, a church is a collection of people who are trying to do gooder and gooder and gooder. And that's just not the case. The church should be a place where people are fixed, who have the, the context to be able to say, and the comfort in the context to say, I'm really hurting, can anybody help me? Rather than saying, I'm at a number 42 on the list, will anybody help me? And they say, well, no, because it might get me dirty. Okay, let's move on. That's the bell curve church. That's what legalism does. And what Paul is trying to say is get out of the artifacts of that legalism. Start loving one another according to the law of Christ. Okay, the free to chill church. What's that all about? Uh, or better titled, the uh, I'm free in Christ to do nothing church. <laughs> now this is, this is a, the, the one is the total spectrum on the other side where you try and compete for goodness. This is the spectrum of saying, hey, I've got liberty in Christ. I no longer have to do a list which means I no longer have to do anything. 
So he says, let's talk about this before we finish the letter. What do you say? Okay, so let's find out what he says about this. You know, you might have been in a place where tithing was required at 10% or you had callings or service positions and you had fast offerings and carrying and all that kind of stuff. Well, now, you know, you read, you read uh, this book and you say, hey, I don't have to tithe 10% anymore. And hey, I don't have to do callings. No one's going to call me and say, do this. And all that. And, hey, I don't have to do fast offerings. Carrying. Hey, I don't have to do anything. Woo-hoo! Does anyone here think that way? Uh, well, we won't, we'll look. Better not. Better not. <laughs> but there is some danger here. There is some danger in this liberty that we find in Christ because now we don't have to do any of those things. We don't have to do any of those things. And we clearly don't have to do any of those things to get back into the competitive structure of who's on number one, number two, and number three. I've got more callings than you. You know, I I don't struggle with what you struggle with, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're free from all that. And that's true. We really are free from all that. But don't go too far on this. (laughs) And that's what he's going to address right here. He's going to say, the one who's taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. This is one of his first a little mini list of things right here about how we should be... Con- well, so what he's saying, the one who's taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. And not to be too obtuse about it, this means that people who hear teaching from the word ought to be sharing with the person who's teaching. Now, here, let me put the contrast on this for a second. Back in the first century Jewish community, um, not only did you take sacrifices to the temple because of your own sins, but there was a temple tax. Do you remember when that shows up in the New Testament? There was a temple tax. So that also supported the religious ecclesiastical community, this temple tax did. And that was something you had to pay. You had to pay. You had to pay the temple tax. And now these guys say, hey, we don't have to pay anyone for anything anymore. This is just way cool. And Paul's saying, well, not quite. There are some people, himself including Paul, who actually work at feeding spiritual food to people, it ought to make sense that they ought to be able to support back physical food. That's all he's talking about. It's really really making a living is what it is. He's saying the people who receive the spiritual food have physical food that they need to share with the people who are providing the spiritual food. That's all he's saying. It's just a practical side. So if you thought being in part of the church where you're freed and do nothing for Jesus... He says, well, that's not exactly true. You still have an obligation, really, to support those who are trying to raise you up, spiritually speaking, and watch out for you. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. Now, I know, I know we're in controversial ground with our ex-LDS folks here because you know, the LDS church says it's actually an abomination to take money to do anything ecclesiastical. Ecclesiastical just means church, spiritual-oriented. And I've had, I, I've lost count, I don't know how many discussions I've had on the phone or an email with folks who are LDS who make this point very strongly. And, uh, and, I, and I get this, I, under, I understand the argument, but man, you go into the New Testament and it speaks exactly against it. And this is one of those places. Let me show you a couple other places. Um, 1 Corinthians 9 is a classic. I just pulled out verses 11 and 14, but read the whole chapter. He says, if we sowed, Paul and his, and his guys with him, like Timothy, if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Like food? Or 14, so also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. That's kind of an in-your-face refutation of that idea that is really popular in the LDS church. But what he's saying is that there are some people who have devoted themselves to your spiritual best, and they've put aside everything else to be able to do that sacrificially. You know, it's just an obligation. You need to sort of give back. Now, if you go all the way back to the temple in Israel, they did it there. There were the Levites. Remember the Levites? And they ran the temple and all that kind of stuff. They were one of the 12 tribes of Israel. But when the tribes of Israel came into the promised land, the Levites didn't get land. There were only really 11 parcels of, parcels of land. So how are the Levites going to live? I mean, they're, they're doing all the stuff at the temple. They're running temple sacrifices, doing all this, the celebrations. How are they going to live? Well, they live off of basically what people bring in for sacrifices and some payment on their behalf to keep them alive. These guys, these Levites, existed 100% to tend to the spiritual welfare of the people of Israel. 100%. And so God said, We need to support them somehow because they can't support themselves. they got no land. They can't raise their own wheat or their own goats or anything. They can't do it. So this model is continued not only in the New Testament and the Old Testament as well. So he's saying being part, being free in the church not to do anything doesn't mean not to support the people who sacrificially are dealing or who are supporting you. And then he goes on, some other practical things. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. For whatever a man sows, 
this he will also reap. Now, the reason he brings this up is because once you say to yourself, I'm free, I don't have to do anything, I don't have to give anything, I'm not obligated to do anything at all, I can just keep my money to myself and spend all my time on myself. woo this is great, I love church. Do you sense kind of a selfish orientation on that all of a sudden? I'm not obligated by God to do anything, so I will obligate myself to spend all my resources and time on me. Well, Paul says... What you sow and what you reap are tied together right here. If you, if you instead of not, you know, voluntarily participating in that community and you decide to turn totally inward, well, you're not going to reap anything really great. And this is what he's getting at right here. The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So what he's saying is that in the way you invest in the, the believer community in that sense, and we're talking about more than just whoever teaches, but in the entire community, he says, if you spend all that stuff on yourself because you think I'm telling you you're free in Christ not to do anything, the problem is you'll become self-centered, and that's a great danger. Use this opportunity not to sow to your own flesh, your own appetites. You use it for spiritual purposes in other people's lives, for their gain in that sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's another place. Yeah, that's, that's, that's part. Saying, yeah. Yeah, and you, gotta be, you have to be very careful here because we've already been very explicit in the first five chapters to say that what you do in terms of goodness can't earn justification with God. That's done with. That was done through Christ. But there's still a role for works in your life is what he's saying. Don't go full tilt boogie over into I'm liberty, I'm free, I don't have to do anything, and now you just focus it all back on yourself. No, nah. no. Nah. Yeah, Dave, you got another? Yes. Easy to confuse. Yeah. This is not salvation. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is not salvation. This is not justification, being made right with the king. This is about how you invest your immediate resources, your time and your money, into what? Yourself or into the spiritual welfare of yourself and others? That's what he's really talking about. You still, it's, it's not an obligation that you need to earn justification this way, but it's still something that needs to be a hallmark of what you do. So really, what happens is when people hear the word about liberty in Christ, I no longer have to do a list of things, sometimes it goes so far on the other side of the spectrum where they say, well, then I can, I'm free to do nothing or anything I want. Well, n- no, that's not the point of this liberty thing. That's over to license. There's something in between that has no bearing on salvation or justification, but there's something in between that operates in the body of Christ that you need to be doing. Um, you have two resources. You have time and you have money. And it, the question is, you can invest those. You can sow those somehow in the ground so that they'll reap some kind of benefit if you're sowing them now that you're free in Christ. If you're sowing them to benefit yourself and your own flesh, well, that's not really a great thing. That's corruption. So that's going to go away. But if you're investing them so as to bring spiritual results, that's a good investment. So don't think that because you're in the church where I'm free, I don't have to do anything, that you still don't have some kind of responsibility to invest well. And this time, not in your own well-being, but in the well-being of others and for spiritual purposes. That's a whole different kind of thing. whole different kind of thing. I'm going to push on. I could talk about that for hours. <clears throat> Nine. So let's not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we'll reap if we do not grow weary. Again, this is not salvation. This is not justification, being made right with the king. This is about the fact that in, when you participate in a community of believers who have been saved by Christ, sacrificially when you were a dirtbag and still are a dirtbag, there is really a, there is a reward in continuing to do good in the lives of others, especially when it's spiritual. And it's, it's actually one of the greatest enjoyments of being a believer. So see, you can become a believer where you understand the liberty in Christ. I no longer have to work to gain God's favor. 
And then you can go into either one, I'll just do nothing or serve myself, or I'll do the opposite. I'll actually serve like Christ served me. And when you do that latter thing, it turns out that life changes radically. It changes radically. And I, I wish we had the time to talk about this, but one of, the, one of the greatest paradoxes of the Christian life is the less you are consumed with yourself, the happier you'll be. In every respect. The less you're consumed with yourself. When Karen and I used to take high schoolers out on uh, kind of mission trips we do, we had this ceremony we did where we'd stand in the church before we got in the vans and drove off, and we'd take off a piece of clothing. Uh, we had jackets. You'd take off a piece of clothing, and you'd throw it on the floor, and you'd say, what I'm doing is I'm taking off myself, myself, my, my, my consumption with self. And today, I'm leaving that here, and from this point on, now I live for the benefit of others. Now, that sounds really depressing, doesn't it? I mean, if I do that, then will I ever become happy? Will I ever, well, this sounds like a horrible trip. Why am I doing this? Oh, it's going to be horrible. But in the reality, the paradox is, the more you do that, the happier you are. And that's actually the definition of sacrificial love anyway. The more you participate in the best for others, the more life for you gets bigger. I can't totally explain that, but that's the way we're wired because we're wired like God and that's the way God is. Really. Oh, we could go a lot on that too. So then verse 10, while we have opportunity, let's do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's do good. Let's do good. Because now you don't have to do good to compete. Now you're free to do good in any way the Spirit leads you and in any unique way he leads you. You're not free from doing good. Now you're free to do good, because you don't have to. You see, you see the difference? It's just a, it's a remarkably different kind of thing. For instance, you know, Christmas, gifts. You have to come up with a gift for every person. Or else, what will they think of you? Well, they'll think horrible things about me. Now I'm making this bigger than I really need to. But there is then, unfortunately, the gift is somewhat tainted by the obligation. See that? Like, I really do have to do this. I really don't have a choice not to do this. I got to do this because I just have to do this. It's, I'm a dirtbag if I knew it. But if you're freed from the situation and you're in another context and someone that you love, you know, you spot something and say, I would just love to give this to that person. They're going to be so tickled and so surprised. This will be awesome. You're free to give, whereas before you weren't. You see the difference? And there's a, there's a great difference in the, in the effect on your life. And you're still just giving. You're just pouring out of who you are. And somehow it has a gigantic return on you. You will always be miserable when you're stuck on yourself. I just can't say that enough. You, you will always... I'll, can I say that one more time? You'll always be miserable when you're stuck on yourself. Because after all, sin and self are synonymous. It would just be sucked right back into the sinfulness of serving you. It's a, it's a huge deal. And it's, it's, much, it's much bigger than, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's much bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. Christ went to the cross, and in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, he went to the cross. For the joy set before him. Are you kidding me? Who would look at the cross and say, here's one of the high points and joyful points of my entire life. I'm going to die. But for him, it was joyful because now he could give the very last, ultimate, everything he had for the benefit of those who would be his. And for him, that was the ultimate joy. And if you're not sensing part of that in your Christian walk, ask God to start developing that in you because that's the central core of who he's turning us into. People who love to be about other people's good. It's why, you know, as Scott was talking about the ministries you do, that's why we're involved in those ministries. It's not because we ought to, and God sent us some kind of charter and says, you as a church, here's your charter, you've got to do this ministry stuff, and you've got to be outward focused, and you've got to do good for other people, and go, okay, I guess I'll do that. You've got to do a TV show, oh, I guess I'll do that. Too. There's nothing about that obligation. What we're obligated to is this love he's, he's building inside of us, and we say there's a great need, and we're driven in that great need to sacrifice on the behalf of other people, and that's why you turn outward instead of inward. Big deal. We need to wrap this up. So the church that you're part of, is it a competitive good structure? Or is it a place where people are comfortable enough to say, I'm on the bottom rung, can you help me? And those of us who understand 
the self-destructive nature of sin can come alongside and get dirty, watching out for ourselves and make sure we don't succumb to the same thing they succumb to, and say, we'll walk together with you to healing. There's only one who heals us, and that's Christ himself. And so we walk with them to Christ. That's what church is supposed to be about. And one last thing, and this is, this is how he puts the, the hooks into legalism. The real question in terms of doing good works, the real question isn't what kind of good works they are, it's who benefits from your good works. Because the people on the left side of this picture did a lot of hard work to get to where they are, and probably benefiting other people if it's a church structure. I'm sure they benefit other people. But who really won in their minds for why they were doing their good works? They did. If the benefit to the good work is you, you're in legalism. That's a very easy determiner. If the benefit is to you, you're in legalism. Well, I went down to the soup kitchen, and I helped feed people who didn't have any food at all, and I spent my entire day down there. It was a great sacrifice, and boy, are my feet hurting. And boy, do I feel like I've just moved up to number four in church. No! If it has any benefit to you, you're in legalism. You can do the same thing and go to the soup kitchen and say, I don't, I don't even want anyone to know I was doing this because my heart is driven out of an agape-like love that's like God's to sacrifice on the behalf of others. I'm just going to go and do this. No one's ever going to know. <sighs> It'll be great. For the joy set before him endured the cross. That's, that's what we're talking about. If it has no benefit to you, then whew, thankfully you're probably out of legalism. But the next time you decide to either do something or not do something, <laughs> Worried about where it'll put you on the bell curve at church, you're still stuck in legalism. Did you hear that? If you're concerned about what other people will think and how it'll change your relative ranking in church, if someone sees you doing or not doing that thing, you're in legalism. You're not in the church that Christ said, you will be my disciples if you'll love one another just like I loved you. Okay? That, and so this is his closing, his closing incredibly practical advice to us. Don't get caught up in the bell curve, church. It's not about you relative to other people in terms of doing more or less good. Drop that. That's a legalistic mind frame. That's totally wrong. And if you think now in Christ you have the liberty to do nothing at all, that's totally wrong. Somewhere in the middle, you understand you're justified by his grace and his sacrifice on your behalf, and now you're free to love for real without benefiting yourself, without obligation. Total, free, unconnected love that just excites your soul as his spirit resonates with you and says, yeah, that's life right there. I think I got one more verse here. Yeah. He said, you were called to freedom. Remember this? You were called to freedom, brethren. Only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. That's, that's investing your freedom on you. But through love, serve one another. And that's all he's been trying to say through all of us. Use that freedom to do incredible things on the behalf and the benefit of other people. Whew. Odd two different practical advices, isn't it? I would never have chosen those in a million years. But that's where he goes to. We don't live in a bell curve church. We're all by ourselves, us and God, me and my dirt bagness, and he and his great grace for me. And thanks be to God that because he died on my behalf, I have life. And it's not about me relative to anyone else. Just to give you a clue, in uh, two weeks, we're going to come back and wrap this up because there's still a little bit at the end of Galatians where Paul's going to give another personal note, and we're going to do it kind of in a fun way. <laughs> but he, again, is going to sum up for us uh, much of what he's talked about. But next week, like Dorothy mentioned, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have uh, a couple here who had um, the guts to go down and start a Christian church in a polygamous group in Mexico and witness to the love of God in their midst. So they're going to be here next week and tell us how do you do that and what's that all about and does it have any effects on the lives of people who are caught in polygamy and fundamentalism? Well, yeah, Chris LeBaron is here with us and she's one of them. So you don't want to miss this because this is really, uh, you won't see this or hear this anywhere else. <laughs> from the LeBaron group. From the LeBaron group. He and his wife are coming up from, the, they're coming up from Mexico as we speak right now, the LeBaron group in Mexico, to tell us about what it's like to talk about the grace of God right smack dab in the heart of a polygamous group. Can you believe it? They do this. There's also another couple that do that right down here in Colorado City in Hilldale. They do the same thing. So, uh, so you don't want to miss this. It'll be just, it'll be miraculous. 
How would you like to get up from where you're living in your comfortable place right now and move into the heart of polygamy in colonial LeBaron, Mexico, hoping that the gospel makes inroads into those who are trapped in polygamy? No one's making eye contact. They live, they live dirt poor here. Dirt poor. Dirt poor. Dirt poor. Wonderful people. And we will, anyway, we'll hear from them next week, and then we'll close Galatians in a fun way after that, okay? Let's, let's pray. We need to quit. Oh, Father, save us from the Bell Curve Church. Lord, give us the humility to be rational and square about who we really are, people who are desperately in need of your salvation, and you have brought that, and that justification being made right with you, and you've brought that. All, it's all you. It's none of us. But Lord, myself included, ah, gosh, so quickly get involved in this pecking order in church about who has the better goodness reputation, and who's sullying their reputation by even admitting to sin. Lord, we so desperately need you for sin because of salvation, but for sin right now as well. And we pray that through your spirit, you'd continue to, in sanctification, to cleanse us and make us new from the inside out. And, and Lord, we think, of, we think of Psalm 24 about what it takes is someone with pure hands, uh, with clean hands and a pure heart. And, and Lord, we can't do the pure heart thing. It's, there's something that's desperately twisted inside of us, and we understand it's from the fall. But Lord, you're in the process of renewing us, of regenerating us. And so, Lord, I pray that in this place and many other places, you would make us people who are quick to raise the issue of sin and quick to say, will you walk me through this because I want to be free of this. And Lord, that we will carry one another's burdens uh, and in the process walk each other to the presence of the healer. You alone do those great things in our lives. And Lord, we're thankful for how you have been changing us. We're thankful for how our taste for sin has changed and our propensity for sin has changed and our, uh, and our very ugly nature that's so bent in on ourselves has been moving out from ourselves and pointing out to others. And that's what you've been doing in our lives. And it's miraculous. I, it's just miraculous. But Lord, there's so much more. And, and as we look at that struggle, as we come to you over and over again and appeal to the throne of grace that you would eradicate this self-destructive tendency we have towards self. Lord, we pray that you'd give us even greater and greater insight into the magnitude of your love that even while we were actively sinning and rebellious, you died for us. That's how much you love someone mired in sin. And you love us all the more right now. So, Father, keep our sights outward. Keep our attentions toward those who are in desperate need of your healing. And we pray that with your spirit residing within us, that you would work your way through us and that we might be your hands and we might be your feet and that people might look and say, you must be disciples of the one who gave himself in great sacrifice. Tell me more about him. Thank you, Father, and continue to, continue to change us in your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.